it's been, despite it's being forced to admit that the sun moves around the earth, Galilei's empirical observations pointing him towards a different explanation. The moral of the story being theory is there to help us to explain reality, not to hide it. And it should not be imposed as a dogmatic creed, but as a valid explanation that works until new data emerge, triggering a search for better explanations. I understand that one of the main challenges of the sociology of religion since its inception has been to understand and explain the articulation between modernity and religion. In our case today here, how to understand this interaction in Latin America. The hegemonic paradigm that explains the intersections between modernity and religion has been and still is the secularization theory. Basically, its main affirmation is that the more modernity, the less religion. The theory arose as an explanation of the religious situation in Western Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries and shaped the way in which we look at religion in the social sciences, establishing the dichotomic categories that we use when we talk about religion, sacred and profane, public and private, spiritual and material, rational, emotional. In addition, it also deter determines what should be called religion and differentiated, for example, from ma magic or who belongs to a religious group and if that belonging is to a church or a sect and how such membership is measured, usually weekly church attendance. There are variants, there are exceptions, there are adaptations and many criticism to the secularization theory. However, it remains an inescapable perspective when we speak about religion, uh, about religion in Latin America. By modernity, we generally understand a way of organizing social life characterized by the separation of social functions and the specialization of a sphere's values. A rationalization that creates a realm from the economy, politics, science, religion, each one with its own authorities, autonom autonomic from other spheres. The implementation of dynamics of capitalism, mercantilism, industrialization, globalization, and the expansion of human rights, civil, political, social, sexual, environmental. Although Latin America experienced modernity in a different way than Europe and the US, those cultural trends, separation of social function, dynamics of capitalism, expansion of human rights are present in our region. We tend to talk about hybrid, uh, incomplete, baroque, forced modernity and so on. However, the noun, when we talk about that is still modernity. The qualifiers are these other words that we use. Latin America has modernized through the 20th century. And this is the Galilean moment. According to the Pew Center study in 2014, and in, uh, that they did in 2014, in 1910, there were about 90, sorry, there were about 95% of people who consider themselves belonging to a religion. By 2014, that number has decreased to 92% of the people, which is three percent points is within a kind of a statistical uh, marginal error. This in spite of commenting about the, the figures, where do these numbers come from whatsoever, but this is the numbers that we have about religion in Latin America. It is true that there is less Catholicism, but it's not true that there is less religion. Furthermore, the most important change in the 20th century, the growth of Pentecostalism has meant more religion, more attendance, more daily rituals, more involvement. In Latin America and perhaps in other parts of the world as well, modernization has transformed religion rather than diminishing it. And this is what I mean for the Epulsi Muove, the contradiction between the reality we observe and the theory we use to explain it. The secularization theory does not explain why religion has not diminished in Latin America. All knowledge has a context of production. One of the problems in understanding Latin American religiosity is the use of categories that were not designed with our religious reality in mind. And when we study religions, which are historical constructions related to concrete cultural dynamics, we cannot pretend to understand them with neutral parameters. They are not, they assume 
the historical experience of the North Atlantic societies as the norm and ignore cultural aspects of the Latin American religious experience. However, and it's, this is something that I, I do think is important, the advantage of continuing using these categories is not a minor one. They allow us to dialogue with colleagues around the world. Sociology, like any other discipline, has a story, a history that has shaped the way in which it looks at reality. Being a product of the 19th century French Enlightenment, it had, from its beginnings, a critical take on religion. Religion has viewed as an irrational and authoritarian imposition of unscientific fables by traditionalist and retrograde organizations that threaten human freedom and cause brutal wars. Religion was a primitive vestige of an obscurantist past. Born into that culture, sociologists were primarily interested in the institutional and intellectual aspect of the religious experience. However, the lights of enlightenment blinded, socio blinded sociology in other aspects. The social imaginary of the enlightenment was, consider was considered the only possible modern model of civilized life. The social actors who were promoting the enlightenment and human emancipation in Europe were involved in the colonial expansion of some European societies in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean in the name of progress. Progress, understood as a scientific, technological, and political development, was the new and true religion that came to replace of curantism. Sociology was part of the colonial ideological apparatus, a way of looking at societies from a Western perspective that was established as the norm. The same bourgeoisie who fought for freedom, equality, and fraternity, and fraternity against the crown and the church during the French Revolution was the one that clung to colonialism and later restored slavery during the Haitian Revolution that started in 1791. It ended up with Napoleon, but the, the revolutionaries, the slaves that revolt against the French were revolting against the French Republic. In the first Latin American independence and the only successful revolution led by slaves, voodoo was more important in giving social connections, emancipatory ideals and collective identity to the revolutionaries than the ideas of the enlightenment supported by secular colonial powers. Or take, for example, Max Weber classics, the Protestant ethics and the spirit of capitalism. Calvinist ethics and capitalism have an elective affinity that according to Weber made North Atlantic societies, and he was basically talking about New England and the Netherlands, more successful, developed, modern than others. <coughs> Weber works published in 1905 during the European colonial expansion in Africa and Asia. However, Weber attributes economic development, increased saving, and a robust financial system only to a specific way of Western religiosity. There is no reference in his works, in his text, in, in the, the, the Protestant ethics, to the territorial incorporation that wiped out native peoples in North American West or the US imperialism. This cartoon here talk about that. You have Latin American sitting here, the states in that being the good kids in the classroom, uh, black people in the US and Native American peoples at the margins and the patronizing attitude that's contemporary to um, Weber. And there is no reference to this expansion of the North Atlantic, the, the New England colonies in, in, the, in the prosperity of, of the US. Neither of the uh, European expansion in Africa, Asia, or the Caribbean, but only the Calvinist industry and austerity. And this is a carriage that for people in Netherlands is more famous, uh, that was built around the time that Weber wrote the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, and, and was used as a sign of the colonial power of the Netherlands at that point. The categories that Weber created which are still unavoidable today when, using socio when studying sociology of religion, completely ignore colonial relationships. My point is that Latin American societies have different experiences of modernity and therefore different ways of articulation, of articulating religion and modernity than the North Atlantic societies. The first generation of sociologists who fixed the categories um, that we still use 
understand the religions in terms of what was established by the religious institutions. The main concerns of secularization theory have been the vitality of religious institutions and how to measure them. What counts as religion, religious practice, and membership is what North Atlantic Christianity understood as such, voluntary and exclusive affiliation, church attendance as a privileged practice, and intellectual adherence to a set of dogmas and institutional mandates. This perspective lived and studied much of the ways in which contemporary Latin Americans relate with suprahuman powers in daily life. Following the idea of an exclusive, an exclusive membership, some scholars assume that the person practice a religion that is distinguishable, that is distinguishable from the rest. They look at the demand that the institution make to the members, but not necessarily explore the concrete responses that people, ordinary people give to those demands. This is problematic when it comes to understand the daily religiosity of Latin Americans. People worship popular singers like Gilda in Argentina or popular figures like Maximón in Guatemala with Catholic rituals or venerate the Christian God with Nahuatl rituals in the, in the Huasteca Potosina in Mexico. Pentecostal believers do have problems with Afro-religious traditions. However, Santeros and Umbanda have no problem practicing and identifying as Catholics in, in some cases. And since, since these kind of responses do not fit within the patterns of exclusive membership, nor follow institutional sanctioned practices, they are disqualified as popular religiosity. A second caste class religiosity ignored by certain scholarship that to some extent that there are no measurement for those things in global, in global surveys about the religious uh, fact. The problem is clearer when academic use church attendance as an indicator for religious vitality. For them, Lack of attendance means less vitality. Even through a weekly attendance is not a requirement of some religions like Judaism, Santeria, or Native American spiritualities. Church attendance has been used as a primary way to measure religious vitality in the US and Europe. But this problematic even among Catholics in Latin America. Rural Latin America was different from France, from France or Britain, where the presence of priests or pastors were taken for granted. In many regions in Latin America, the Catholic Church gave much more importance to the annual celebration of the patron saint, an opportunity when a priest would visit the town, celebrate the masses, baptisms, weddings, confessions, and, and, and not the, the Sunday uh, church attendance, because it was impossible to provide with masses to their whole cities in, in the colonial times. One thing was Lima and Mexico, but the rest of the countries, and, and I can say that because Nestor is here, but like Montevideo, Cordoba, were marginal cities around the, 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 Latin, Amer and the Latin America. Weekly church attendance that not appear to be an, uh, an appropriate method to measure religious vitality uh, when we think about Latin American Catholics. Um, finally, some authors use the secularization as a normative vision of society rather than a theory based on empirical data. The laicite model that is prevalent in Latin America with its definition of functions of church and state with a secular public space is established as a norm, a model that must be imitated for a society to be considered modern or progressive. And beyond, we, if we agree or not with that, one thing is a normative way of looking at reality. Another thing is reading the data that we get from reality. Secularization is a political project in this case, and not so much a theoretical explanation of empirical observations. Summing up, this paradigm that presuppose an inevitable decline of religion is not useful in Latin America. We can say that religion a pur si muove. In spite of theories and political models, evidence shows that religion is present and strong in different spaces. Modernity has changed the relationship of individuals to churches and the location of churches in the public sphere. But until now, it has not confined religion to the private sphere not eradicated it from Latin American societies. In search um, 
and let me keep using the metaphors from uh, astronomy. Um, the discipline and the astronomy has been experiencing an impressive amount of discoveries. One of the most significant tools that trigger those discoveries has been the telescope. It seems that this one was the one that Galileo used. Uh, and he started to use that in 1609. Telescope has developed and spread all over the world, making incredible discoveries with them. However, at the beginning of the 20th century, scientists searched for other ways in which to observe wavelengths and develop and incorporate radio telescopes into astronomy toolbox. This multi-wayband approach opened new windows for discoveries that optical telescope could not find. They look at the same universe, but to different aspects of it. And perhaps that's my take uh, with the idea of live religion. Instead of looking at institutional dimensions, our proposal is to pay attention to practices that ordinary individuals deem religious in their daily life. In Latin America, many colleagues have used the category of popular religiosity to describe the interactions between religion and modernity. Rather than the institution, the paradigm focus on religious practices. Under the category of popular religiosity, they include the great range of practices that fuse in a Catholic matrix the spiritualities of Native American peoples, Afro traditions, and popular culture. This paradigm emphasizes the tension between the person and the institution and highlights the existence of a communal instance in between the individual and the official organization. Popular religiosity started in the colonial era when the lack of priests left local communities in charge of the religious practice, giving rise to a non-clerical form of Catholicism outside the regulations of the elites. Most of the authors that use this concept emphasize the idea of popular, the anti-elite anti -elite component of the, uh, of the concept. This religiosity is the way the poor used to oppose the dominant culture, a religious response of the people to the modernization imposed by the elite. This position assumes that the elites adhere to a traditional orthodox and highly institutionalized religion. I think the popular religiosity model set the foundations for this radio telescope. It highlights a very modern characteristic of religion, the agency of the religious person. It opposed to a more institutional view of the secularization theories. Popular religiosity emphasized the creativity of the religious people and their ability to reproduce religion in relation with, but not necessarily limited by religious institutions. It also pays attention to the community as an intermediate reality between the subject and the organization. However, I think that is limited when trying to explain the contemporary religious landscape. Usually in Latin America, when we talk about uh, popular religiosity, we're thinking about Catholic religiosity. Therefore, the conceptualization tends to omit Pentecostal, other religious minorities, and the unaffiliated who are part of the Latin American religious landscape. To start building the radio telescope, that is to study the relationship between modernity and religion in Latin America, looking at the religious practices and experiences of ordinary people, a group of 11 researchers from four universities with the support of the John Templeto Foundation conducted a study on live religion in three Latin American cities, Lima in Peru, Montevideo in Uruguay, and Nestor da Costa, who is present here, was the team leader in Montevideo at the co-PI for the project, and Cordoba in Argentina, with partners in Bilbao and Rome. And, and later we can talk about the project if, if you want more information about that. By live religion, we understood the practices that ordinary people carry out in, every, in everyday situations to contact with superhuman powers. Live religion is sloppy, multifaceted, eclectic, and expressed in experiences and practices where believers involve bodies and emotions. Many times these practices originate in a religious tradition, but people adapt, modify, recreate, and mix them. These are practices as, and as such, because their practices incorporate body, emotions, objects, and stories chosen by individuals from an available repertoire that is not limited by their confessions with autonomy, meaning that the religious authorities are not the only ones defining what counts as proper religion and whatnot. 
Therefore, in the research, we explore aspects of that the participants consider religious in their lives, leaving in their hands the definition of what they consider of what they consider as such, trying to make visible aspects of Latin American religiosity that had not always been evident when applying traditional scientific categories. Averting our eyes from organized religion and established sociological categories allow us to see the rest of the image, to attend what happens in the daily life of the subjects. From the perspective of live religion, we pay attention to what people do to connect with supra, the suprahuman, to what Eloisa Martin calls sacralization practices. We saw that in Latin America, religion is practiced at home, on the streets, in the workplace, and at any time. Following Nancy Ammerman and Meredith McGuire, we think that the live religion approach show us the capacity of the actors to produce and express religious meaning in daily life. It highlights the fact that religion is personalized, is a personalized social construction, not just an institutional imposition. We look at religion as space where subjects exercise autonomy and creativity with the limitations of any human freedom. A collage that people make with available elements of different traditions modify and, modify and resignify by the actors and related to other choices in their lives. And let me be clear, live religion is not an individual private category. Religious activities are cultural realities, as Abby was mentioning at the beginning, that uh, go beyond any given individual. Live religion, even if personal, is not isolated from the community. It happens in a cultural setting. People express themselves through practices informed by both institutional and popular religious traditions. They tell their own story in a, in a language that has been established by the community. Live religion keep, I think, the popular religiosity contributions highlighting the role of religious practitioners as agents that create and modify religions. At the same time, it goes beyond the idea of religion of the poor. Adapt, uh, everyone adapt. It's not just the poor that adapt and the lead do the pure thing. There's not a true religion and then a religion of the, pure, the poor, the women, the, it's every religion is of someone. Um, within, it, it focuses also in religion and spirituality within and without traditions. Live religion opens up the space also for a synchronic view of the religious practices beyond the denominational borders, highlighting the interconnectedness of practices in a given cultural context. We added two aspects to our research that were, um, that were useful to broaden the idea of live religion. Our project was comparative from the very beginning. Among three cities, we work on the design, data collection, and the analysis of the data, and the, sorry, data collection, analysis of the data, and even in some publications. This comparative nature of our project make us also aware of a second fact, the religious history of the cities, the context matter when we try to understand and explain findings. The focus on practices and people uh, and what people do and experience open spaces for dialogues between scholars. We can talk about practices and experiences, methodologies to collect data, while keeping open the discussion about the theoretical model. Live religion in that sense is limited. It's not a paradigm or a theoretical model, but an approach is, again, it's, it's a tool, it's our radio telescope. And just to finish, and I keep using the astronomy metaphors. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, when the new data was coming from many empirical developments, astronomy needed a new theoretical model to make sense of the observations. Today, the most accepted explanation was the Big Bang Theory. And this is the guy, the priest, who set the basis for this model. And this is the paper that he published in a peer-reviewed journal, as any good academic, uh, in the 2020s, uh, 1920s in, in uh, Belgium. In our case, the data collected, and it is consistent with what many other colleagues have seen, suggests that in Latin American modernity, there are spaces for a relationship with the suprahuman power in everyday life. To name this particular tension between modernity and religion, we propose the category of enchanted modernity. And I keep talking with the we of if we have a kind of uh, common uh, 
mindset. We have talked with Nestor and, and Hugo and Catalina many times about this. And so there, there are many differences there, but it's what the best that we have so far. The idea of disenchantment of the world, and we talk about enchanted modernity. The idea of the disenchanted modernity, the disenchantment of the world was used for the first time by Weber in a lecture given in 1918 to explain the European religious situation. Some have pointed out that the better translation should have been something like the magization of the world. Uh, in any case, the idea of an enchanted modernity allows us to use two terms familiar to sociologists, enchantment and modernity, but meaning something new, an articulation between religion and modernity different from those of the North Atlantic societies. While the idea of enchantment connect us to um, a broader sociological tradition that understand modernity at this enchantment, it also links us to a trend among colleagues who have highlighted the enchantment present in Latin American societies. Peruvian anthropologist Manuel Marsal used the idea of Tierra Encantada, enchanted land, to explain Latin American religious culture. Catalina Romero talks about secularidad encantada, enchanted secularity, to explain the religious and cultural dynamics in the Peruvian public space. Aldo Mejeras, Pablo Semán, Cristina Gutierrez, René de la Torre, and many others describe this feature as a way of looking at reality not limited by Western rationalization. Christian Parker, a Chilean sociologist, referred to it as a different logic. Although it might be an oxymoron in Western societies, the idea of enchanted modernity could help us discover characteristics of Latin American religiosity that we cannot observe if we continue, if the, if we continue using tools that were built for other historical situations. The enchanted modernity makes us look beyond institutional definitions of what religion should be and how it should be practiced. Thus, it makes us, it takes us beyond the concerns of secularization theory, the vitality of religious institutions in modern societies. By enchantment, I refer to both the institutionalized religion and the other religiosities that are sometimes labeled as spirituality, new age, new paganism, and so on. Religiosity outside religions and inside religions. It emphasizes enchantment, the fact that for many people there are forces beyond human realm which are experienced in everyday life. Religion is an ongoing human relation with a suprahuman being. We are looking for a category that allows us to understand the religious experience from a sociological point of view, since supraempirical or transcendence do not do it properly. The relationship is not supraempirical in the sense that the suprahuman power is beyond the world. For people who practice, religion is very empirical. They experience the suprahuman power through their senses. They see it, they hear it, they touch it, smell it. It's not a transcendental reality just opposed to an immanent world. There's only one reality. The idea that there are insurmountable limits between immanence and transcendence does not accurately, accurately describe the experience of a relationship with the disease, for example. In the same way, the respondents assume that the superhuman power, the superhuman powers are here in this world. They also perceive that the world in which they live is a network of human relationship that will endure in the other world. Because superhuman powers are present here and now, any person in any circumstance can be assigned an opportunity to experience them. Human relationships are enchanted. Latin American enchantment does not retreat to the private sphere. It has social and political consequences. However, it is a modern enchantment. Modernity means that the enchantment does not imply the suppression of human agency. Interventions of the suprahuman in the world are linked to human activity. The saying, uh, God, help, God help those who help themselves, describes a conception present in many interviews. Participants ask God more for opportunities than for solutions, spaces where they can exercise agency rather than the finished miracles. It is modern because 
the fact that suprahuman powers are present and active in this human life, present in secular spheres like economy, asking for jobs, science when they pray for health, and politics when they pray to navigate the right uh, type of the bureaucracy. However, it does not imply that religious leaders have carte blanche to intervene as they wish in any social sphere. Enchantment does not mean the superposition of spheres values, the collapse of the differentiation of social functions, or the identification of religious morality and customs with the civil laws of the country. Participants reserve spaces where the voice of religious authority is heard and others where it is ignored. To finish, um, just to be clear, this is not a self speech for the idea of enchanted modernity. What interests me today is to open the discussion with you to start a process of collaborative construction and correction to explore better, way, better ways to theorize what we study. Take this talk as a call for a kind of collaborative uh, thinking, a search for perspectives that will help us to better understand contemporary religiousness between public and private, north and south, beyond the usual approaches. Thank you very much for the invitation and for your time.